day on Thursdays when we get to chat with Michael Redman from the Artesia Historical Museum and Art Center. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Hopefully uh, the rain has been good for the grounds around the museum. Oh, yes, the flowers are looking uh, are looking quite nice. That's, that's it's great. It's great to have rain like this. Have you been able to spend much time in the in the yard and the, the grounds around the museum this year? I've I've spent a little less time than usual because I've noticed that we've had a lot more uh, insects outside, especially tarantula hawks. So I, it's probably best to give them space. That's true. That's true. Um, do you have any special types of flowers or uh, anything that you've done special to be representative of the area that uh, on the grounds there? Oh, we have. Uh, well, for example, we have rose bushes, and uh, rose lawn got its name because of all the roses that were planted along it. Yep. Shortly after the town was laid out. So what uh, we have. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, we have other types of flowers. Uh, honestly, uh, most of them are just green to me, so I I can't really <laughs> tell what they are. But I recognize them, and I've seen them elsewhere. Yeah, uh, the sunflowers didn't grow this year. We have a lot of uh, datura plants, which that's quite common out here. They're uh, those uh, like jimson weed, that type of plant, mm -hmm. has the, the big white uh, flowers that when they uh, after the after they're pollinated, uh, they form those uh, very uh, spiky, pointy uh, seed pods. Yeah, and you can find those growing all over the place out out in the. Uh, just out in the wild, in the southwest. It might be kind of fun. A lot of smartphones have artificial intelligence uh, scanning and learning capability. It might be kind of fun to just take the phone and, okay, does it actually recognize what it really is? <laughs> you could test the accuracy of the of the phone software. So, well, where would you like to take us today? Well, today uh, I think will be the last week for talking about movies. Uh, I know. Uh, I was hoping to finish it up in August, and unfortunately today is the first day of September. It'll be the perfect uh, day for starting a new topic. But it'll be one last week of movies. Okay, and we were talking about movies depicting the Old West and, uh, and so forth. Uh, which movie would you like to talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about another movie uh, covering the Old West, a movie that was supposed that, that sort of changed the way films were done. Um, sort of, in a way, um, from a greater perspective, that would be the case. But just from looking at it from a uh, from a museum perspective, it's just more of the same. Uh, the film Sons of Great Bear. Sons of Great Bear. Okay, tell us about this movie. Well, it's a uh, it's a western from uh, East Germany. Which is, uh, you know, that in itself sounds uh, unusual. Right. Uh, it was filmed uh, uh, partly in East Germany and partly in Yugoslavia. No, wait, no. Uh, oh goodness. I think it was uh, no. I think it was filmed partly in Albania. Okay. They needed to get the mountain scenes, and they couldn't find that in uh, in East Germany. And it was supposed to be. A film that uh, that looked at uh, the American Western, but with a uh, sort of a East German uh, communist uh, sort of perspective. Okay. And so instead of uh, being like a John Wayne Western, where where it focuses on the big hero who travels around and and does what he does as a rancher or a farmer or, or a soldier or a sheriff. It focuses on one, uh, it focuses on a Lakota person and his uh, immediate family and the bands that he travels around with instead of on the, uh, on the uh, Euro-Americans. So it's uh, sort of uh, flipped around reversed from, uh, from the usual. Mm-hmm. And it shows them, uh, it, it focuses on them, it, it features them, and, it, and it's supposed to show them in a sympathetic light. So 
usually in westerns before this uh, uh, it would focus on you know on on white people like John Wayne mm -hmm. and the Indians would uh, be not so much characters as much as they were plot devices you saw that with Chisholm uh, film Chisholm where uh, where he goes over to uh, Fort Stanton and interacts with them briefly and then leaves same with the uh, Earlier in the movie, uh, there's that scene with the Mexican bandits who are who are hired to try to steal horses from Chisholm. They're not characters or plot devices. Right, right. And so they, so the East German uh, uh, director tried to flip it around in order to make the uh, in order to make the white people the uh, plot devices. Which. So, so, and when did you say when this movie came out? Oh, I'm never good with dates. I believe it was 1966. Okay. So this is a 1960s movie, and was this the East Germans or the West Germans? Oh, East Germans. East Germans, okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there was some kind of a propaganda purpose behind this. Oh, definitely. In part, it was, uh, it was after you know, World War II has been over for a couple decades. People want to go to movies. They want to see movies, and... They've been smuggling in uh, American movies for a while, so they wanted to show that uh, that uh, East Germany can prepare uh, film great movies too. And partly, there already was existing a, a genre of uh, East German Western novels, and this was in fact uh, adapted from a novel written before by a famous uh, East German uh, author. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it and it did have a propaganda purpose in a way, as a sort of counterpart to Hollywood films. It was propaganda in that way. Uh, they also incorporate things that uh, were just kind of not historically inaccurate, not very, not very uh, good to include, uh, like portraying the uh, the fighting in the. Uh, in the West, as a class struggle between the Indians and the uh, and the white people, mm -hmm. and in fact had a bit where the where the hero from the movie vowed to uh, to uh, become farmers and own their own land, and they didn't want the uh, didn't want the army to drive them off their land which uh, didn't make sense because the Lakota people, of course, uh, did not want to become farmers. That was something that the army was trying to force them to become. Part of the, uh, part of uh, President Grant's peace plan and later, later uh, 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 perfected after this film was set uh, with the Dawes Act, which divided up reservations into individual uh, farm plots that uh, the Native Americans were forced to uh, to own and farm upon. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, so that scene just that that, that kind of threw me off because that's not that's not all what the uh, Lakota people felt. But that was part of the propaganda. It was uh, the the Western struggles were class struggles between uh, the Indian proletariat and the uh, and the wealthy people who controlled the army. And uh, that kind of the storyline behind that with the people living behind uh, the Iron Curtain were being told uh, was right and wrong about how they were being ruled uh, at that particular time. So very interesting perspective. So did it get distributed just in East Germany or is this something that is now available that people can see around the rest of the world oh you can watch it online but it was uh, distributed throughout uh throughout uh, the warsaw pact okay it, it was it was popular in, in east germany and czechoslovakia and and even not aligned nations like yugoslavia mm -hmm. so it was it was fairly popular and i think the popularity wasn't because of the propaganda but because despite uh well 
despite portraying itself as being a uh, sort of East German response to the Western, it had a lot of things that you'd find in Westerns from this uh, era. Okay, such as? Such as uh, really bad costumes, uh, <laughs> uh, a lack of understanding of material culture from the 1870s, and uh, just those sort of Hollywood tropes that you'd find. So, I mean, the costuming was just typical Western sort of costuming with uh, some East uh, German flair, because, uh, of course, they, they wore those uh, silly uh, small vests that didn't have buttons and didn't have pockets that were made out of leather. They were completely impractical for the 1870s, because the point of having a vest is partly to keep you warm, but mostly because it had pockets. You had extra pockets, so you'd be able to carry stuff. Mm -hmm. The army uniforms were uh, kind of off. The coloring, of, of course, the, the, the coloring, you, you can't really blame them too much because that could just be the film stock, but right. like the, uh, the, the coats that they wore had tall uh, collars, which you wouldn't find on, uh, on military uh, coats from that era especially because on the tall collars, they had a uh, army insignia, which is really not appropriate. That's 1890s, late 1880s, 1890s. So that's incorrect for the uh, era. Everybody's waistline was way too low. This was still uh, the era of high waistlines, and so everybody had their pants uh, low. Mm -hmm. And what was most... Uh, most obvious is that the soldiers uh, were wearing uh, what looked to be like uh, East German uh, border guard uh, jack boots, not uh, cavalry boots. Sure. Well, I would assume that in the mid 1960s in East Germany, it probably was difficult to get a lot of help and research and resources from the West. So they probably did the best they could. I wonder where they would have gotten their material to uh, influence or, or where they got their concepts and their ideas of, uh, you know, this this is what we think a, a uniform would look like at this time based on the materials that we have available to us and our, uh, our concepts of that. I wonder where they would have been able to do their research at that time. Well, they would have done their research over here. They would have... And with... With East Germany, they, of course, had restrictions on what knowledge and access people could have to Western information, but it wasn't an absolute restriction. Historians could still travel over here. They could still get books. And so much of this looked so influenced by American Western movies that the directors probably watched uh, illegal movies. Mm -hmm. Just for research purposes. Right, right. Because when you're higher up in society, you can get away with things in East Germany. That's, uh, that's true. So, um, so you watched the movie. Um, was there anything else about the movie that, that stood out or seemed of interest uh, to you as you were watching it? Well, it's, well, like, like I said, it, it followed a lot of those Hollywood tropes that when you really think about it, it just doesn't make sense. Like, it's the 1870s, it's a frontier fort, but it has a wooden palisade built around it, which isn't accurate. And the fort was about 50% civilians, which is really uh, questionable. Mm -hmm. And then they spend a lot of time in a bar drinking, and you see that there's a player piano, which is a little, a little way too early for a player piano to be out there, and how would they get it at an obscure little fort? You really have to think about that. How would they, uh, I mean, when you have limited space in wagons and you're trying to sell food, like canned food from the east, because you get good profit margins off of that, why would you transport a player piano? Mm -hmm. And other things, like uh, cigarettes existed uh, during this time, but almost everybody was smoking a cigarette. That's, that's really overrepresented. Not that many people smoked at that time, or, or they didn't smoke cigarettes? Well, oh, specifically cigarettes. 
Okay. They existed. They were not too common. Uh, you'd find them more in cities because they were popular in all well, cities. Right. Not so much out in the frontier where you'd more expect to see pipes and uh, chewing tobacco. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, overrepresented. Yeah. But what really, what really, you know, su- what really surprised me is the sort of uh, views they had on on how the military operated. Like uh, one of the early scenes, there was a uh, supply wagon being transported around, and the escort was really small, and half the people escorting it were civilians. Which that does not seem to make any sense at all. Sure. Like, that's not how the Army operated. But what really, what was really surprising was uh, there was another scene shortly afterwards. One officer pulls out a revolver, points it at the hero. His uh, superior officer pulls out his revolver, shoots the gun out of his uh, subordinate's hand. Which, I, that, that's a Hollywood trope. You see that in a lot of Westerns, people shooting guns out of people's hands. Mm-hmm. But in a situation like that, that commanding officer is guaranteed a court-martial. Yeah. If he's not going to be fragged by his own soldiers. Right, right. Because it's the 1870s. Why would an officer do that to protect a a Native American person, especially when they're actively at war? And when you really think about it, if you shoot a a gun out of someone's hand, their their hand's going to be really, really damaged. Yes, yes, it's definitely going to hurt. They're not. Yeah, uh, well, not just hurt. You're you're going to be losing fingers. Mm-hmm. And then that character, I mean, that that that's like something that could uh, end someone's army career, thanks to the recipient, not just the shooter. Right, right. Well, and it, but. A movie like this, I guess, is meant to be a serious movie and not a not a comedy or a uh, s- something like that. Is that why it seems uh, these types of things you you pick up on and and point out? Well, I, I pick up on these things because I've studied, uh, you know, to a certain extent, material culture of the 1870s. So when something seems off, I notice it. But also. And you see, there there are Hollywood movies where they actually try to portray these sort of uh, scenarios in a realistic manner. Right. And so when you see it uh, done in that way, in a, uh, well, it's a serious movie, but in part two, they just didn't really have a, they didn't have a large budget. They they probably spent most of their budget on just getting to, uh, getting all the materials out to the scenes because you see things like, uh, there's no squibs for uh, for gunshots, so there's scenes where people are shot, and you don't really, you're not really sure what happened or who got shot until finally someone uh, drops down. Right. So that sort of dramatic pause where they're shot, but they're not reacting to it. There's no, there's there's very little, very little for costuming or special effects like that. It's right. All just uh, East German people wearing grease paint and. Uh, really bad wigs. <laughs> That's right. So the movie is, uh, uh, it's it's called the... Uh, the Sons of Great Bear. The Sons of Great Bear, and it is available online if you want to, if you want to check it out one of these days. I, I found the German version on the International Movie Database, the title in German, and that's what was confusing me. <laughs> so, all right, uh, about 30 seconds left. Anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Uh, yes, uh, at the museum we have the, uh, we have our Fashionable Founding Fathers exhibit open until the end of the month. So be sure to stop by and learn about menswear of 1905. And your uh, regular hours, uh, well, you've got a holiday coming up, but you're not open.